Uh, good morning and uh, good, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Very pleased that we are joined today by some of the world's leading voices on financial stability and investment funds. I am also very proud of our latest contribution to this policy discussion from the IMF's Monetary and Capital Markets uh, Department. I want to recognize uh, Tobias Adrian, uh, the head of the department, for putting together the discussion we are going to have today. To illustrate the importance of our new report, we need to go back to the height of the crisis in March of 2020. We were facing the biggest economic shock in our lifetimes, but we did not face another global financial crisis last year, not only because of the extraordinary monetary and fiscal measures, and they were extraordinary, but also because countries had worked together after the global financial crisis to strengthen the resilience of the banking sector to ensure that banks have more reliable liquidity and capital cushions. They are there. Last year's experience was less encouraging for the investment fund sector because the crisis exposed fundamental vulnerabilities that could affect global financial stability if left unaddressed. Many investment funds were heavily affected by the financial market turmoil and the initial shock was amplified by rapid fund outflows and rapid sales of assets as liquidity suddenly dried up in key markets. Uh, the so-called dash for cash extended across borders, which triggered significant capital outflows from emerging and developing markets. Got us all very nervous. Today, the global economic recovery is underway, but there is also growing uncertainty, including rising concerns over stretched asset valuations. And it is therefore not surprising that policymakers and regulators are keeping a close eye on investment funds. Uh, over the past two decades, non-bank financial institutions have come to play such a key role that they now hold about 50% of global financial assets. This benefits everything from entrepreneurs growing their businesses to families buying their first home to saving for retirement. These investment funds are vital engines of prosperity. They come in all shapes and sizes, money market funds, open-end mutual funds, and they are subject to a range of investor protection and market conduct regulations. But we also know that many funds have ventured into higher risk investments, uh, high yield debt, real estate, which leaves them more exposed to liquidity pressures in times of distress. And this in turn demands greater vigilance to ensure that critical parts of the financial system do not freeze up when they are needed most. So our key message today is this. If we are to safeguard financial stability at the national and global levels, we need to boost the resilience of investment funds. What can policymakers do one priority is to further strengthen risk management, especially liquidity risk management. Our new report shows how this can be achieved with a combination of liquidity management tools. The key is that these tools can be deployed sequentially as needed, depending on the intensity of pressures facing a particular fund. It means that funds would no longer have to rely on so-called redemption fees and gates linked to regulatory thresholds. And this is what was problematic last year. These measures would benefit all investment funds, but especially those holding less liquid assets. And I want to stress that point. We also believe that there is room for 
more prescriptive regulatory approaches in this critical area. And here we can draw on the lessons learned in the banking sector. We saw a significant strengthening of risk management in banks, largely because of stronger regulatory frameworks put in place after the global financial crisis. We know this approach has served us well. And it is even more important now. Just think of the risk of financial spillovers that could hit emerging and developing economies. Uh, again, this is an area where investment funds play a central role. Over the past decade, we have seen almost $1 trillion in foreign investment in emerging market sovereign debt, with investment funds accounting for about two-thirds of these vital capital flows. In our report, we provide specific proposals on how to mitigate capital flow volatility, how to better manage cross-border fund flows in times of crisis. These are important measures, but we need to go further. Even as some countries strengthen their policies and step up investment fund reforms, we must continue to be vigilant about those who try to game the system. Fighting regulatory arbitrage across borders remains critical. And this is why we need strong international cooperation. It lies at the heart of the ongoing reform process led by the Financial Stability Board. And it reflects the joint efforts of national supervisory authorities and central banks the International Organization of Security Commissions and other standard setting bodies, and of course, international financial institutions such as the IMF. Policymakers worked together to make banks safer after the global financial crisis. And now we must do the same for investment funds. We know that financial stability risks remain elevated. We know asset prices are stretched. So speed is of the essence when it comes to these reforms. Financial risks take time to build. But when conditions can shift quickly and pose new and unforeseen challenges to the financial sector, as we saw during the turmoil of May 2020, then uh, we recognize that building up of these risks over time can suddenly hit uh, with a very strong uh, force. Given the vital role of investment funds in fostering growth and safeguarding financial stability, we need to take the right actions now to boost their resilience for the future. And this is what our discussion today is going to be. Very much look forward to hearing your views on this critical issue. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristalina, for these um, uh, opening remarks. And uh, I'm extremely happy uh, to have a panel with four very distinguished speakers with us today. Let me introduce each of the speaker in alphabetical order. Um, first is Ashley Alder, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission. Uh, and uh, he's also the Chairman of the Board of the International Organization of Securities Commission, IASCO and also a member of the Financial Stability Board's Plenary and Steering Committee. Welcome, uh, Ashley, and good evening to you. Of course, you're dialing in from Hong Kong, uh, where it is uh, getting late. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, second is Andrew Bailey, uh, who is the governor of the Bank of England uh, since March of last year. He served previously as the CEO of the UK Financial Conduct Authority, FCA. Um, as a CEO of the S FCA, he was also a member of the Prudential Regulation Committee, the Financial Policy Committee, and the Board of the Financial Conduct Authority. 
welcome Andrew. And let me note here that Andrew has to drop off a little bit before the end uh, of the event. So uh, we will uh, start uh, with questions to Andrew right after I introduce everybody. Our third uh, panelist is Natasha Kavinav, who is the executive director of the European Securities and Markets Authority, ESMA, uh, since June of uh, this year. Uh, and uh, prior to taking up this role, she was the managing director and head of policy at the French Authority uh, of Markets, or of, uh, uh, Autorité des Marchés Financiers, AMF. Uh, during that period, she was elected twice as chair of IASCO's Policy Committee on Investment Management, and she was also appointed co-chair of the Financial Stability Board's expert group on shadow banking. Uh, welcome, Natasha. Finally, we have Jeremy Stein, who is the uh, Safra Professor of Economics at Harvard, and he also serves on the board of directors of uh, the Harvard Management Company. Uh, Jeremy was also a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve from 2012 to 2014. Welcome, Jeremy. So let me uh, jump straight into the questions. Uh, we have an exciting topic today. Uh, so let me start with Andrew uh, Bailey. Uh, in a recent speech at ISDA, you highlighted the importance of taking our second chance to make money markets more resilient, and particularly money market funds. What, in your views, are the key steps that will need to be taken, and why were the reforms introduced following the GFC insufficient? Andrew. Thanks, Tobias, and, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this fascinating and really important uh, event, uh, and very timely as well. I, I, I want to start with a couple of sort of what I sort of I sort of regard as sort of key underpinnings of this debate. And the first one is something that Kristalina said in her introductory remarks, it's, it's very important. Christina said that, rightly that there's been a very big increase in non-bank intermediation, um, and, and both in absolute terms and relative to the banking sector. Now, the point I wanted to add to that is we shouldn't, as policymakers, be really surprised about this, um, because in a way what we were doing, of course, in the reforms to the banking system that we did in the financial crisis was to sort of change the terms of trade, if you like, um, between the, the the cost, of, the cost of bank intermediation and the cost of non-bank intermediation by increasing the regulation of the banking system. Moreover, in doing that, and I think this is a key point here, we were effectively also saying that there were some asset classes that were you know, quite commonly held on the, on, on the balance sheets of banks, particularly those that got into trouble, that were not appropriate to, in a sense, back deposit assets, demand deposit assets. And by implication, therefore, we're better, we're better finding their way into the non-banking system particularly more liquid assets. You know, I'll give an example of commercial property and the fact that you know, the, the, the amount of commercial property on bank balance sheets has declined rapidly since the financial crisis, and, and in my view, rightly. Secondly, um, statement of the obvious, but I think it's important to make, the banking system is a principal world, i.e. a principle in the sense of it is a principle-based model. Um, you, know, you deposit your money onto the, onto the balance sheets of a bank the non-bank world is an agency world. Um, and, I, and that's an important point in terms of shaping our responses because it's interesting that I don't think it's always you know, given quite, quite the prominence that I think it does have to have in thinking about, the, about what we do. I'd, I'd add to that that not only is an agency world, but certainly when I look at the model we have in the UK, it's also what we, we call it collective investment schemes. In other words, you know, those, who, those who invest in them have rights as a result of their investors, and they have collective rights which shape the behavior and, 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 uh, of, of the funds necessarily. They are different to banks in that sense. Now, on the question about what, you know, why didn't we get it first time round? I mean, I think what we were focused on first time round was very much those non banks that were, in effect, very closely mimicking banks. And, you know, in, a way, in many ways, the origin of the term shadow banking, which we tend not to, we don't use so much these days was things like constant net asset value money market funds funds it's the things that sort of as we used to say you know quacked like a duck looked walked like a duck but didn't call themselves a duck um but had all the properties of one and you know were, were had all the, in a sense all the risks i think what we didn't tackle 
because in a way we didn't, you know, in a sense they hadn't materialized, was that the to be expanded non-bank sector could pose macro prudential risks of its own, which we've now seen materialize in terms of under stress, you know, the, the behavior of, of, of investors. And as I think Kristalina was saying, you know, the characteristic of sort of liquidity of, of thresholds and gates and how those in themselves can have macroeconomic, macro prudential, sorry, effects. Um, and it's, you know, it's that that is, of course, you know, really the focus of what we're doing now. Now, I should say that because of the collective investment point, I'll make this a bit, you know, there are both what I call micro issues here and macro issues in terms of how, how these vehicles operate. And the two come together very closely. The, you know, the regime that we design for macro purposes has to be consistent with the, chat, with the, with the micro regime and the challenges we face. So to finish off, I mean, what are we tackling? Well, I think Christine is right, right. I mean, the, the threshold effects are important because we've seen that those threshold effects can generate cliff edges, which generate macro issues. Then I think we've got the question of what are the, what are the sort of the, you know, what are the effects and characteristics that the solutions to this uh, may generate? I think we need much better liquidity classification, but it's not easy. I don't think we should, anybody should pretend that classifying you know assets in a non-bank sector into liquidity buckets is easy but it is important we then need obviously much better um, characteristics in terms of how we match the liquidity of the assets to the terms on which investors can use the fund and we also need to address the question of you know is there a pricing solution in there now that gets you to the question of swing pricing which is my final point the pricing solution is interesting um, because it, it obviously is important going right back to the collective investment point, because in a collective scheme, obviously, you know, the first mover and advantage point has to be severely limited because otherwise you breach the principle of the, of the, of the, of the collective scheme. Now, swing pricing, to my mind, is, is one of these things where the principle of it, um, and I'm using principle in a different meaning, <laughs> uh, with the LE ending, not the AL ending, the principle is, is, in a sense, is clear. It's, you know, it's, it's marginal pricing. You know, the, the exiting investor should exit at the marginal price of the marginal cost. The practice, <laughs> and I think it's a big question we have to answer in the work ahead of us, is can you turn the principle robustly into the practice? Because I'm afraid I think what, when I see the evidence um, from, from some, of the, some of the practices I look at, what gets called swing pricing in, in, in the world we're in at the moment isn't really marginal pricing, I think, in the way that, I, I use this term carefully, and you know, as economists we would look at it. Um, and that brings in, that, that calls into, into play the sort of the big question of, you know, how these various solutions work. I think that we're going to have to have a menu of solutions. I think, I think we have to have a common, internationally common definition of the, of the problem. I think we are going to have to have a menu of solutions because markets are somewhat different uh, and we have to allow for that. But, but of course, the solutions have to solve the problem. And we have to really be convinced that the solutions are robust. So I'll finish there, to Piers. Thank you so much, Andrew. And that was uh, very uh, insightful indeed. Um, uh, one of the things you pointed to was the, the menu of options uh, uh, for regulators to implement. Um, and of course, uh, there is a balancing act here. On the one hand, uh, you want to have a consistent approach across countries, uh, but on the other hand, there are many country-specific issues. So my, my next question is to Natasha. Um, as we look at the issues uh, highlighted by the market turmoil uh, that Andrew uh, was discussing, um, you know, many commentators uh, continue to, to push for jurisdiction-specific reforms, but on the other hand, uh, of course, capital markets are global. So how do you balance uh, the global approach and the national specificities? And let me also thank uh, Kuselina and you for the invitation. I'm really honored to be participating in this discussion. A very difficult question you're asking me actually, Tobias, and let me echo also what was said in the introduction that we are looking at an industry that has increased threefold in the last decade and now represents just a mutual fund industry, 64 trillion US dollars. So with that growth, the concerns and questions that have been raised are just legitimate by nature, right? Absolutely. 
I think um, what, I, what I look at the work that has been done, it seems to me that all the analytical work, the engagement that has been done under the leadership of both IOSCO and the FSB, and all the discussions that we have um, seen together, including the lessons learned from two major crises, have led the whole community uh, to come to a common understanding of what we think are the risks that this industry represents to financial stability. And let me just echo a few things. First, normally this industry is supposed to spread risk across the system. So they're supposed to actually be shock absorbers rather than shock spreaders. That's not very elegant, but to put it that way. Uh, but actually having worked throughout these different episodes and looked in detail, we do find that there are some situations where actually they do present risk to the global financial system, and we need to look at them a bit more closely. The common understanding is around three key risks in my understanding that are common globally, which are leverage, the liquidity issue that Andrew explained very clearly, but also the asset valuation that Kristalina touched upon, which I think is extremely important as well. So those three key risks. At the same time, we've also um, experienced and observed a very growing interconnection between the investment fund industry and the rest of the ecosystem. So there's also a common understanding that we need to look at these issues holistically and the impact on the global market and other market participants in the system. So what the challenge is now to find the right solutions, right, to these once we've agreed generally on what the what the problems are. But let me answer, try to answer your question, um, which is difficult. I agree with everything that has been said, which is international consistency is absolutely needed precisely because of this interconnectedness nature and because of the cross-border effect. So that is really something we cannot avoid. Plus, this industry actually is by nature cross-border because you can have a manager in a jurisdiction, you can have a fund in another, you can distribute your funds globally. So there are impacts and we need to be mindful of that. Overall, now investment funds, where everybody's a little bit convinced that they can act also as a contagion channel. So they can be an amplifier in some circumstances to the financial system. So in that context, again, to answer your question, yes, international consistency is absolutely key. And actually, just to give an example, in Europe, I think it's very interesting to see, it's like a laboratory. We do have to face these issues very acutely because precisely we are working on a zone very highly interconnected, but with different authorities in each country. And so every day we are actually deploying significant efforts to try and foster further convergence, both at the rule and also in supervisory practices on the ground. So at the same time, you mentioned the jurisdiction specific factor, but that is also very true. Even in the situation of highly interconnected markets, there are some specificities that are predominantly local. We look at tax systems, pension systems, accounting roles. Those are very local. And so when the international community comes to a common understanding of how to address a certain risk, there needs to be some flexibility to accommodate at jurisdiction level how that will be implemented. So to find the right balance between those two perspectives, um, let me just suggest a few guideposts. It seems to me in the first place, the reforms should seek to address or at least mitigate identified vulnerabilities. So if we all agree on what the risks are, we should all have reforms that address those specific risks. Second, we should all be mindful of these cross-border spillovers or potential unintended consequences. And I cannot emphasize more how much it's important in these international fora, the dialogue, so that there is an understanding of the impact, for example, on emerging markets or in other jurisdictions of measures that can be taken in one place or another. And third, of course, the reforms have to be aligned with international standards. I think we can take comfort in the fact that in the past, we have collectively succeeded in some areas to take these very strong directions internationally. If you look at the way we worked on reducing mechanistic reliance on credit rating um, agencies, if we looked at how we decided with the G20 impetus to provide oversight for the hedge fund industry, or in 2012 with the IOSCO recommendations on money market funds, that really cleaned up the market and clarified this is what a money market fund is and they address a whole set of risks even though again even if significant progress has been made the recent crisis has showed that there are additional areas where we need to strengthen uh, the system one point i wanted to add to these guideposts is data i think collectively also we would be stronger if we can build the, the decision making on what needs to be internationally, what needs to be jurisdiction specific, or what particular risks we're facing if we had access to data. And this still is in the fund industry a challenge that we are all facing, being able to narrow down exactly the impact and the risks. And finally, on crisis management, I wanted to emphasize this point, which is that even if we define the best, the most robust system, as we have done, for example, in the banking sector post-global financial crisis, we still need to have those connection lines that when something hits, 
we are able to come together and share experiences and understand precisely to see when measures are taken, what the impact can be elsewhere. So not a very straightforward answer to your question, Tobias, but I, I do think it's a little bit more subtle. Overall, we definitely need, and ESMA is committed to work with the international community for strong standards, but also some leeway for jurisdiction-specific tailoring when you implement them. Yeah, that that uh, is is uh, making a lot of sense. Thank you so much, Natasha, for the for the very clear explanation. Um, so let me turn to Ashley uh, next. Ashley, you have been uh, working closely as chair of IASCO uh, with the Financial Stability Board, in particular the non-bank financial institution uh, subcommittee of the Financial Stability Board, uh, in order to uh, to take the next step in these uh, global uh, regulations. Is there is there anything that you can share in terms of your thinking about progress so far? Uh, well, thanks, Tobias. And um, firstly, it's great to be here. Uh, you've launched your report at just the right moment because uh, at the, uh, uh, right now, the discussions, the policy discussions at an international organization level are sort of reaching uh, a set of initial conclusions around money market funds. And they are also pretty intense when it comes to uh, open-ended funds. Um, so that's first thing. Second thing is, I can share a fair amount, I think, about the sort of flavor of the discussions. So Tobias, please, if I if I go on too long, too long do, do, do not be embarrassed, but to stop. No worries, no worries. <laughs> we have quite a bit of time. Please go ahead. I think the, right, the audience is, is very interested. <laughs> there is quite a lot going on. So look, in terms of um, you know the question of international organization cooperation, um, from my perspective as chair of IOSCO, we, we've never had a closer relationship uh, with FSB than we have now. Uh, and I say that against a background, a historic background, where we have tended to be somewhat siloed uh, and somewhat um, uh, focused on our respective turfs as opposed to cooperate. And that's a big difference. And it's been really happening over the last, what, 18 months, two years or so. It's been uh, helped by the fact that um, IOSCO recognized that there needed to be full of much better engagement uh, to bring our expertise, our data, our supervisory experience to bear, uh, and also to interact with the experiences and the perspectives of the central banks effectively. And we've did, done that by setting up a group within IOSCO called the Financial, Se Financial Stability Engagement Group, not a particularly original title, that's all we can think of at the time, um, and that group, headed by the chairs of the French AMF and CFTC in the US, have been doing some great work alongside their FSB colleagues. Now, um, so that's what's been happening. Um, we are dealing with a broad spectrum of NBFI. The, as Andrew pointed out, we've got a new term for shadow banking, but it's more than that because it recognizes that the shadow banking debate was somewhat misguided, in my view, because it was attempting to look at credit intermediation analogues for banking, um, whereas NBFI is looking at the distinctive risks within the non-bank system, which is, I think, is, a, is, a, is, a, is intellectually and practically the right thing to do. Um, we're doing, so we're looking at a broad spectrum. In relation to funds, we're looking at two areas. Uh, the first is in relation to money market funds. That is more advanced. The second is in relation to open-ended funds in general. Uh, that is extremely active, but less advanced. Uh, and I should just say that you know the, the, the market dynamics and structural characteristics and purposes and functions of money market funds and open-ended funds are very, very different, which is basically why we're assessing the risks and the vulnerabilities and answers uh, separately. So if I can, if I could start off with open-ended funds, we um, in IOSCO uh, and, the, uh, and the FSB are conducting joint work, which is really to do a much, much um, deeper dig on uh, what happened in March 2020. Um, uh, now, what I'll do now, I think I'll just go through, if I may, just some of the considerations, more so from the perspectives of securities regulators, because after all, I am one and I chair the organization <laughs> of securities regulators at commissions. So, um, so if I can go through that. Firstly, what was the securities regulators experience in March? 
Um, I mean, we certainly saw in relation to open-ended funds, we certainly saw large outflows. And of course, those outflows were particularly uh, noticed and possibly predictably in bond funds of various types, including corporate bond funds. And the trigger was quite clear. It was the trigger was the was effectively the pandemic, the lockdowns, the flight to safety uh, and invest in liquidity needs when it comes to it. Um, ultimately, the open ended fund sector did weather the crisis uh, pretty well. Many of our members kind of reported uh, varying levels of regulatory engagement, some fairly intense real time around the way in which funds uh, would operate and deploy uh, liquidity risk management tools. Um, so that was really our experience. But I'm setting aside this question of central bank intervention at the time, which is which is super important because a lot of the discussion revolves around, you know, what are the consequences of that uh, from a policy perspective. But having said that, and just moving on, the the, the key question that we're ne now looking at is this in the context of this joint work, which is basically did uh, did funds, open-ended funds, who had liquidity mismatches during that stress lead to um, a sort of variety or level of first mover advantage? And did that in itself lead to effects that should cause us to worry about financial stability concerns. So that's, you know, that's the key question we're now looking at. Now, we, our view at the moment, and again, I'd say this is, you know, this is a sort of uh, current IOSCO view, is that some of the models and methodologies used by academics um, don't, yet prove the materiality and the economic impact of liquidity mismatches, um, which then drove excess sales in corporate bond markets. I'm not saying that they didn't, but it's a question of, it's an evidential and data issue around this. Uh, and I think it is important in this context to look at broader um, potential drivers uh, around redemption behavior. Um, now, clearly, getting back to sort of, you know, if you sort of look, look at the sort of traditional remit of security of regulators, uh, there are uh, investor protection concerns in any event. And we need, we need only to look back at incidents like the Woodford case in the UK and such like. We can see that. And that was fundamentally about very, very liquid assets and the redemption mismatch. Um, but we do think that more work is needed to link this to systemic financial stability effects, uh, which are system wide. As I say, I just should emphasize, we're not saying that there are no financial stability effects, because clearly it is a live debate, but we need to do a bit more work to get there. Um, and just a, a linked point is that open-ended funds occupy or, or operate or hold around 24% of US bond markets. And I think, as I understand it, the the equivalent number in the EU is about 15%, and overall 10% of global markets. That basically means that there are many, many other participants, whether sovereign wealth funds, whether insurance, whether uh, endowments, pension uh, systems, etc. So I think in relation to a very important question, which is vulnerabilities at fund level, which are it's absolutely right we examine those, but we need to understand the interconnections between the broader spectrum of investors, including funds, and the underlying markets and the characteristics of those markets. And I think that is a, a super important point to, to bear in mind. Just on the point of uh, central banks, there's, there's a central question. I'm not going to try and answer it because it's, it's actually quite a sensitive one. But the question is, did central banks bail out uh, funds? Um, now, there's no doubt that the interventions last year, which were, uh, what's the best word, massive uh, and very effective, they certainly stabilized uh, the underlying markets and you know, in particular the underlying bond markets, central banks went into areas and intervened or intervened in areas they would never had before, in markets they would never had before. And so those markets themselves 
most of the interventions took place in, in relation to those markets. And certainly that bank intervention had a broader uh, confidence outcome for markets as a whole, not, not, not just the, the corporate bond markets uh, and others where there was direct intervention. Uh, and of course, in intervening in those markets, liquidity was effectively provided or restored for all market participants, open-ended funds, other funds and, uh, and other investors. Um, that begs a question about the interrelationship, which I've just touched on, between vulnerabilities and funds and vulnerabilities and characteristics of the underlying markets here. And the question then we need to ask ourselves, which we are asking, is are there justifications and are there ways in which one can enhance the uh, liquidity inherent in the underlying markets themselves, recognizing that many of these so far do not demonstrate, even in normal times, um, the sort of liquidity you might expect in, say, equity markets. Uh, and then finally, in relation to central bank intervention, there's an interesting question, which is possibly the most sensitive one about moral hazard. You know, and I think I didn't need to rehearse what the issue is, really. The question, really, in a sense, is, you know, do the, did those central bank uh, interventions result in a, an outcome whereby there could be future moral hazard at the, the level of funds and fund management? Now, the central bank's intervention, you know, did take place in the context of uh, a pretty extraordinary exogenous uh, shock uh, to the whole system. And in my view, they weren't explicitly aimed at uh, fund vulnerabilities like mismatches, liquidity, liquidity mismatches. So I think then the jury is still out as to whether or not there is actually a moral hazard issue here in relation to central bank intervention. Um, and then just briefly, uh, on the way forward, um, this, the joint work about open-ended funds and the examination and isolation of the issues that we need to agree on to progress to potential policy uh, outcomes at an international level, that work will be uh, completed fairly shortly. I'm confident that the IOSCO and FSB will uh, end up with a consensus on, on, on the report, and that's going to, that report will be basically furnished to the uh, G20 in time for its, uh, to be factored into the G20 uh, October meetings. Um, we do think in terms of, um, you know, policy, we do think that uh, liquidity, mis uh, uh, liquidity management tools should be better deployed. Um, Andrew has mentioned some of the difficulties around swing pricing. It's not straightforward at all. Um, but fundamentally, it must be right uh, that a large part of the answer here involves uh, targeting uh, redemption costs, which, which in itself then deals with first, first mover advantage, and that as a, as a trigger. But there is a lot more work to do. It is not straightforward. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, there is further work to do to assess the economic significance and materiality um, uh, of uh, liquidity and redemption mismatches uh, and first mover advantage to and, and the link to, between that and the stresses in the underlying markets. And in relation to that, I think the IMF report is, is very useful. Um, so that's really where we, uh, where we are. We've, as I say, we've got some further work. I'm confident that the FSB and IOSCO will reach uh, joint conclusions on this. Uh, and we have pretty much done that on MMS. Uh, Tobias, do you want me to briefly just go through what we've been doing on money market funds? So let's do this in the second round because I'm I'm uh, wary of uh, Andrew Bailey's hard stop uh, in about 12 minutes. So I wanted to get back to Andrew, uh, and why don't you cover the money market funds in the second round? Uh, sure. Let me first turn uh, to Jeremy. Um, so uh, Ashley uh, and Natasha. Uh, pointed to the importance uh, of, um, you know, first mover advantages and, and amplification mechanisms uh, from uh, the investment fund sector. But they also questioned to what extent the magnitudes are important for policy purposes. And of course, you're a leading academic that has contributed to uh, this literature. 
Um, so, you know, is it, is it the central banks that have to provide the liquidity in times of crisis, or is it uh, ex ante regulation that is the better uh, tool here? And, um, you know, have these issues uh, become more prominent uh, in the past decade or so? Uh, Jeremy, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. So thanks, thanks so much for including me uh, on this very important topic. So on central bank liquidity, if it's just liquidity that you're talking about, so essentially lending to the dealers, uh, you have to step back and ask whether somehow, you know, removing frictions for the dealers who, who can absorb these flows is going to be a first order solution. Um, and, you know, of course, I'm, uh, I'm all for removing any frictions, whether they're regulatory or market structure, that would allow dealers basically to do what dealers should be doing. Um, I'm skeptical that that is basically the first order thing. It's helpful, not against it, but I'm, I'm skeptical it's sort of the first order solution um, uh, to think about this. And, you know, you guys have rightly pointed out that, you know, an open end fund that holds as assets things like high yield bonds and leveraged loans, they're kind of like a bank, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the thing that we worry about kind of is uh, our runs. And we don't say that with, you know, bank runs, think about it. We don't say that if we worry about a bank run and a bank holds, um, I don't know, jumbo mortgage loans or small business loans, we don't say that we're gonna tackle this by trying to make a more liquid market in small business loans. Right. We say, well, the assets are inherently illiquid, so we're going to have to have either deposit insurance or a lender of last resort. Um, and the point is, you know, fundamentally strip away all the frictions. Right. The market is going to deliver an amount of market making capacity in any asset that is adequate to handle essentially normal times order flow. Right. So if there's a lot of volume on normal days, the profit motive will bring, you know, bring forth a fair amount of market making capital. But it's not going to bring forth enough for the one day out of a thousand. Right. It's just not no matter no matter what you uh, what institutional environment, you just can't earn an adequate return. And so you're always going to have a problem with sort of 10 standard deviation days. And the, the essence of a run is it's a highly nonlinear thing, and you're gonna get flows that are just way, you know, order of magnitude different um, than you get on normal days, right? And so there's just gonna be a limit to sort of how much capital there is in this, what's called the dealer community. So if all you're willing to do, I, mean, I shouldn't say all, but if, if what a central bank is willing to do is to lend to the dealer community on one of those days, I don't know that it's the liquidity that's the issue, it's just sort of the capital. I mean, of course, the central bank can take their capital out of the picture by offering to buy bonds as they did, as the Fed did. But that's a very different thing and raises, I think, enormous issues of sort of political economy and moral hazards. So, I mean, I think you guys had it right in the paper. I mean, I think the right analogy is to banks. Um, and you have to deal not by sort of saying we're going to have somebody buy all these fire sold assets. You have to work on preventing the run or at least mitigating the run ex ante. So then the question becomes how you how you do that. Um, and so, you know, there, in your paper, and we've already had a fair bit of discussion about swing pricing. Um, you know, the best thing about swing pricing, I think, is we have a pretty coherent theory of why it makes sense, right? I think we understand very well the idea of a first mover advantage when there are illiquid assets. And if your diagnosis of the problem is that it's a first mover advantage. Well, it's what Andrew said, you wanna sort of internalize that first mover advantage by pricing it correctly. And if you can do that, that's in some sense, if that's your diagnosis and you're confident that that's the diagnosis, something like at least idealized, uh, setting aside, I think the very real practical concerns that Andrew raised, idealized swing pricing would sort of be the solution. So I think that's right for sure. Um, I agree. I agree that you know it's, we're a little less clear uh, in the data that that's the dominant thing. And so my sense is, you know, well, I, I think it makes absolute sense to try to make progress on this. There are a variety of other mechanisms, right? I mean, maybe they've been a little bit less well explored, but there are a variety of other mechanisms that cause fragility in these vehicles that are not literally first mover advantage. 
and you know, you know, are they um, anything that's basically a form of positive feedback, whether it's stop loss or leverage limits or some kind of behavioral panic, um, all of those will create a, a, a feedback mechanism that when you have illiquid assets, you'll get outflows, you'll get a big push down on price, that'll create sort of further. And if those are the mechanisms, it's not as clear that swing pricing is an absolute um, panacea. And one thing that uh, I wanted to mention, I know nobody's brought this up yet, are exchange traded funds, okay? If you thought, if you really you know, had a kind of clear conceptual view that the problem was a first mover advantage and was exclusively a first mover advantage, I think you would love exchange traded funds because they have Andrew's idealized swing pricing. It's sort of endogenous. In other words, when a lot, a lot of people want to leave, the price of the ETF falls relative to the net asset value. That's like a varying, an endogenous time varying swing price. Right. And, and in fact, you know, in the, in the crisis, there was a fairly big discount of price to net asset value. So that's exactly what you would want that, you know, there is no first mover advantage by sort of by the construction of the way an ETF works. There's no first mover advantage. You eat all your own price pressure. Okay? Yet, yet we saw fairly substantial outflows um, from exchange traded funds. And my guess is none of us are prepared to say, oh, we can fix this entire problem by just making every uh, mutual fund in the world change itself to an exchange traded fund. So I, I think that tells you that there are these other mechanisms as well, um, and that we need to, you know, while not dismissing at all swing pricing, I think we need to think um, more broadly. And, and, and Andrew hinted at this, um, you know, there was a recent uh, Brookings paper or Brookings project that was led by Don Cohn and Glenn Hubbard, and they talked about this and they, they went so far as to talk about you know, then maybe there for some assets, for some categories of funds, we want to have just absolute ex ante limits on how much investors can withdraw over a given period. Um, and I'm not, I'm not at all prepared to say that that's the right answer. But I think at this stage of the game, these sort of more um, aggressive, for lack of a better word, solutions want to stay on the table, at least, because I, I'm a little, I'm a little hesitant to think that's, you know, again, swing pricing is sort of intellectually elegant. I'm, I'm a little hesitant to think that it's it's a panacea for 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 things. So again, I, I would just hope at this point we keep a, a relatively open view of what the what the possible uh, approaches to this might be. Thanks so much, Jeremy. And uh, so we have had our first uh, policy proposal of this morning, uh, which is to put more emphasis on ETFs because some of the uh, illiquidity is is priced into into the basis uh, of ETFs relative to the underlying. Uh, that's certainly fascinating. And uh, both uh, Jeremy and Ashley also mentioned this question about the role of regulation versus the role of backstops by central banks and uh, whether there are an ex ante uh, incentives that get distorted because central banks are coming in again and again. So Andrew Bailey, as both uh, governor of the Bank of England and former chair of the SCA, uh, how do you how do you balance uh, this? On the one hand, liquidity provision in times of crisis, but on the other hand, you know how much do you want to regulate ex ante so that the central bank perhaps might only come in uh, in further in in the tail? Well, I, I think you you do want to regulate ex ante where you, where you identify particularly where you identify the uh, financial stability risk and the macro potential risk. So I think you do, but I think that what we've learned from uh, the experiences of the last few years, and indeed the work that's now going on in Basel actually, is that as central banks, I think, and, and it goes back to this point about the shift in the balance of financial intermediation, that you know, for central banks that have traditionally relied on the banking system as the means to inject liquidity into the financial system. You know, if I go back to my, last March, and the, the problem that we confronted was that if we had tried to inject the necessary liquidity to deal with this problem via the banking system, our diagnosis was that it wouldn't have worked. Not a criticism of the banks, it just wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have got to the right places. Consequence was that we had to go for you know, a very blunt and very big instrument, which was to do asset purchases. Now, you know, we don't think that's the, you know, it worked, but I think it worked, but we don't think that's the right, the, the right way to do it in the system. But, to have. but I do think, and this is why we're doing the work in Basel, that 
as central banks, we, we are and have to confront the fact that we do accept that there is a backstop role uh, to provide liquidity into the non-bank system where, where the you know, ex-ante regulation hasn't, hasn't done everything it needs to. For the reason Jeremy said about the, the, tales, of the, the tales of the distribution of events, now, but it, but it needs to be done on the same basis that you know, we always attempt to do it with banks and we don't always succeed. And we've actually designed that, that I think, you know, it, it should, you know, in a sense, adhere to what I tend, you know, tend to call the sort of the budget principles, going back to the you know, Walter budget, which is, you know, it is the last line of resource. It should be readily available, but there is a penalty price for doing it. So I think, you know, I, I think and expect and uh, you know, I really hope, actually, that you know, there will be backstop facilities that central banks provide, which are more tailored to the to the challenge that we're facing than the asset purchases approach that we used last year that emerge out of this. And I think that's it's a big it's obviously a big development and a big change for central banks, but I think it's consistent with recognizing you know, the liquidity the liquidity implications and the liquidity risks to the system that arise from the challenges of non-banks. So I don't see this as in any sense sort of sacrilegious. I see it as sort of a natural development uh, but needs to be done in the right way. Thank you, Andrew. That's that's very clear. And um, um, I think one of the questions is how, f you know, at what point does the central bank come in? Of course, the global pandemic is a massive shock and we would expect central banks to come in. But then there are some smaller shocks like recessions or so, and perhaps you wouldn't uh, expect central banks to come in. So where, where is sort of like the optimal cutoff, I think is, is one of the key questions here. Um, so let me turn back to, to Ashley. And uh, first of all, allow uh, Ashley- to... I've got to drop off now. Of course, of so course. Just... Thank you, Andrew. It's a fascinating and very important conversation. So thank you for organizing it. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for having uh, the time uh, this afternoon uh, in your time zone. Very good to see Bye. you. So, Ashley, first I wanted to give you a chance to react to what others have said. Uh, you know, in particular, Jeremy made some, some points that I think are very pertinent. Secondly, you did want to say more about the money market funds. And I would be particularly interested in the question of swing pricing for money market funds. We know there are open-ended funds in a number of jurisdictions with swing pricing. But is this even feasible for money market funds? Um, and then uh, thirdly, of course, you know, uh, coming back to the international uh, reform efforts, are both central banks and regulators going to be happy at the end? Ashley. I've learned by now to unmute myself. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, just some reactions. I, mean, I, I don't actually, I don't disagree with anything that anybody said, although, you know, um, uh, but I would point out that I think underlying uh, this whole debate, whether money market funds or whether open-ended funds, is that we are still, to an extent, grappling with um, working out how you effectively translate um, some long-standing assumptions on how you potentially regulate risks lying in the balance sheets of banks and translate that to the agency model that uh, Andrew mentioned which is non-bank financial in intermediation. And that, that, that's really, really important for a number of reasons, one of which is that, um, uh, you know, there is unlikely here to be a one-size-fits-all approach. That does not mean there cannot be uh, international standards, recommendations, uh, et cetera. But there doesn't likely to be a one-size-fits-all fits -all approach because unlike banks, investment funds are very heterogeneous, you know, so different investment strategies, different investor bases, uh, and different jurisdictional uh, background. Uh, and the other thing I'd say about this is that, you know, market-based finance is all about finding um, or building in the information and looking at the dealing behavior, et cetera, to, to find prices. And prices react, obviously, to a whole host uh, of, 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 of signals. But ultimately, we are dealing with investment assets through an agency uh, structure. Um, and in, I would certainly say in normal times, but possibly even in some stress times, price declines are not necessarily 
the equivalent of a market failure. So there's a difficult balance to strike in relation to that. And that basically goes to this question of what type of resilience do you mandate into a, a fund? How much does that resilience cost when investors are, when that cost is then a factor around prices and also broader investor behavior and choices uh, as well? Uh, and then the second angle to that, which I think most of, uh, well, all of us have touched on, is once you've built in that level of resilience, uh, to what extent is it then still uh, expected or uh, acceptable that there is ultimately a backstop? And I think Andrew, who, who's, who's now uh, dropped off, but Andrew was basically saying, yes, there is a backstop, because that is a fundamental central bank uh, function. But the question of backstops in markets really needs further discussion because it isn't isn't the equivalent of backstops in bank banking um uh so that's that, that's uh, the first thing second thing in relation to uh money market funds just in general um uh iosco uh, together with the fsb has have been working extremely hard on a set of uh, policy proposals based on a set of identified vulnerabilities in money market funds uh, we consulted uh, on, uh, well, we issued a consultation report in, um, in June, I think it was. Um, and as part of that report, one thing, well, one thing that it, it was very clear on is that one of the key differentiators between money market funds and other funds uh, was the fact that money market funds invest in short term funding markets which have their own special characteristics. And I needn't really go into what they are, because I think for most of the audience, they'll be, they'll be aware. And also aware that those short-term funding markets did encounter severe disruption, you know, with a, you know, commercial paper, CDs, uh, and a lot of that was denominated in US dollars, which is a, also a factor around this. Now, we do have right now a, an emerging consensus around policy tools. It's not nailed down completely yet, but we do have an, an emerging consensus. Now, I could go through that. The first of which has been discussed, which is basically the rather simple one, which is, in a sense, deregulation, because it's about removing ties between regulatory thresholds and fees and gates. Um, secondly, I think we have a fair degree of consensus over further work around redemption pricing tools we don't think, I mean, the characteristics of money market funds and the way in which investors uh, move in and out of them means that swing pricing is not seen to be particularly practical. So therefore, other tools such as anti dilution levies and fees look to be more sensible. They achieve the same effect, basically. So, and they also are subject to some of the same problems which Andrew referred to around swing pricing. And so remove the ties, uh, redemption pricing tools, really, really important. Thirdly, liquidity requirements for fund assets. That's quite difficult because it does, it's intrusive around the investment philosophy and positioning of a fund. Different funds sold different products with different characteristics to investors, but nevertheless, it's, worth, it's certainly worth uh, looking at. And it has, of course, it has been looked at in the past in relation to money market funds in any event. So looking at... Now, in our consultation, there was virtually, as I've written down here in my notes, little support. There was basically no support of any size for loss absorption tools, such as minimal balance or risk or capital buffers. They were seen to be, in part, to be remedies that may be suitable for balance sheet risk, um, as distinct from the sort of risks we're looking at in relation to, uh, to funds. Uh, and again, they were also seen to be um, possibly a dead weight on investment performance in normal times. And thirdly, the question is, do they really solve the problem? Because if it was known that there was a specific buffer, then there may be a, an increased first, first mover advantage uh, among those who know there's a buffer and they want to make sure that they move before it's used up effectively. So there are a set of issues around those. There, was, there were mixed tools about uh, the question of macroprudential tools. In other words, authorities stepping in to do the things that managers may need to do but don't do because of you know, stigma effects and, and such like. Um, 
So mixed views on that. My view on macro potential, it's a big topic. It's quite controversial, is it needs further work, but it shouldn't be taken off the table. You know, I, I, I do think there needs to be further thought around this. But again, it needs to be associated with a very clear view around uh, the structural differences between NBFI funds and, and, and banking. And then finally, I'll just say that, you know, the EU and the US are building right now their own frameworks around this. But nevertheless, I think, you know, we are getting to the position where we have a common agreement on money market fund vulnerabilities. And we have a pretty, we have an emerging uh, consensus around uh, the policy options. And ultimately, we would be looking to make sure that the, the jurisdictions uh, pay attention to those policy options when looking at the vulnerabilities that are, that are uh, specific to their jurisdictions, which may vary. And the final thing I'd say around money market funds is that uh, there does need to be further work on the underlying markets. I'm skeptical about, about whether or not, or not from an official sector perspective we can do anything about underlying markets. I mean, it's very difficult to, in reality, to introduce uh, uh, or mandate structures to create liquidity in markets that are structurally illiquid <laughs> in reality. But nevertheless, we need to understand a lot more about the short-term funding markets themselves, given that that's uh, at least half of the problem, not necessarily the thing. So that's where we are with that. I think uh, in relation to are we going to get, I think you asked, are we going to get to a kind of consensus or an outcome as between IOSCO, uh, FSB, and others. I think overall, I sort of, I think I answered this earlier on. I think the answer is yes, because the discussion is so much more sophisticated than it has been in the past, because we are able to bring in central banking perspectives, um, which usually have a starting point from a sort of banking analogy. And they're also bring, able to bring in uh, the uh, perspective of securities regulators, which actually has a starting point in investor protection. But as now, now we've embraced the financial stability uh, angle to that. But I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. That was uh, very rich. Uh, a lot of content here. And um, I, I would wholeheartedly agree that uh, these discussions among uh, the FSB and the IASCO have been very, very fruitful. Um, and I found uh, perhaps more constructive than those 10 years ago after the global financial crisis. I feel like uh, our thinking has matured as a, as a policy community. And uh, um, the optimism that came through in your remarks, I think, uh, is, is broadly shared. Um, so let me uh, turn back uh, to Natasha and, and Jeremy. So Natasha, uh, we, we heard a lot. Uh, first question is whether you want to react to anything uh, that others said. And then uh, my second question is, is really a little bit uh, Europe-specific. Uh, you're running ESMA, the European Security Markets as, uh, uh, Authority. Um, you know, what are the priorities uh, in the next year or two uh, in terms of reforms, in terms of financial stability? Natasha. Yes, and so I'll try to bring in the supervisory aspect to this discussion, but let me just first react on one small point that I think we should really bear in mind. The fundamental difference between investment funds and banking world is that investors are supposed to bear the cost. And therefore, I would be very concerned if at some point we, we give the impression that the investor should expect to receive his money at par at the end of the day, because precisely that could lead to wrong expectations and potential runs, whereas we emphasize very much in the regulation, the investor, you are only an investor, markets can go up and down, and you are exposed to market risk, credit risk, liquidity risk, etc. And so the disclosures are very, very um, dense and, and detailed to make sure the investor understands that. So it's only in those rare circumstances where actually the market completely goes out that the expectation could be really um, not met. But just, just a side note, but I think it's important to bear that in mind for the alignment. That's also what tails back to the role of the supervisor, which is to make sure precisely there's consistency, and that comes also from the international community. There should be consistency and alignment between the assets and the investment strategy and the redemption policy. That is something that is in the FSB recommendations and it's many regulatory frameworks. But what that really means is that depending on the nature of each of these diverse types of funds, that should actually come into play at some point. And so money market funds are very special animals. 
and that's why we discuss so much this daily liquidity, even intraday liquidity, but there are other funds on the spectrum and we need to be mindful of that alignment. So very quickly on your question, Tobias, I wanted to bring back the supervisory angle because we talked about uh, ex ante intervention. We talked about all the way at the end, you know, whether in one in a million times central bank has to step in. But something very important in my view and in one of our priorities is, is the supervision. So I'll start just with money market funds and then move to supervision. The money market funds, just to confirm what Ashley was saying, ESMA is working very hard to put forward an opinion. We have to provide what we call a technical advice to the European Commission with our recommendations as the European supervisor on what we think needs to be changed in the European framework, the money market fund regulation here in the EU. And so, of course, we're very, very uh, engaged in the international community with the FSB, with the NIOSCO, and we're taking on board all of these considerations as we go through the responses to our consultation and put forward proposals for reform. It'll be up to the Commission and the European legislators to decide what to do. But all these discussions about what's appropriate or not in the policy toolkit are very much taken into consideration. I have to stop here. I can't give more details at this point. On the supervisory side, what I wanted to bring in is that we have been working very hard with our colleagues in exactly what you described, Ashley, with the the intensity and the, the constructive discussions between securities regulators and financial stability and prudential authorities is also taking place in the EU. So we're working very much with the ESRB, the European Systemic Risk Board. And I just wanted to mention a few of our priorities in the very short term. We have worked based um, uh, on the ESRB's recommendation that was asking us to take a look with the national supervisors whether corporate bond funds and real estate funds could sustain a big crisis. So they said, these are the funds that we deem the most vulnerable. What would happen if there were to be a strong crisis? So we went into the markets with the national supervisors, looked in detail, and we came up with a report in November 2020 that demonstrated that generally asset managers could sustain heightened risks and they could, they could walk through them, but there were still some vulnerabilities that need to be looked at, in particular, some funds that may not have this alignment I was referring to earlier, where you see that they're not equipped with appropriate tools, so they have a strategy, potentially investing in less liquid assets, but they're not equipped to face a situation, so that's an issue. And so a number of findings there that we will be looking at now as a follow-up to check with the national supervisors whether those managers have actually implemented. The importance of these types of exercises is to say it's not enough to have just a framework. We need to make sure it's actually live, that managers implement it and you enforce it. Another exercise we've conducted with the national supervisors is more broadly on all types of mutual funds that we call usage in the European context to see what was the liquidity risk management framework. And here too, we conducted what we call a common supervised reaction. So all authorities conduct at the same time an exercise and engage with their industry to see what comes up. Here again, we identified some shortcomings and we're going to be following up. The last one that I think is even more interesting with what you said and we didn't touch upon very much today is the asset valuation one. A lot of um, managers have complained of the challenges around valuation, valuation of assets in their portfolios during these, you know, when markets freeze. And so it's interesting that we will be launching the similar kind of exercise, a common supervisory action in 2022 to look in detail how this is done in practice with the managers. We have our framework. But how is it actually done in practice? And we will, again, follow up if we identify any fragilities or vulnerabilities there. The last point I wanted to mention to close the loop of the discussion we've had today also with the central bank interventions is that ESMA remains committed to contributing to this difficult conversation about macro prudential in the area of investment funds. So we think this conversation, Ashley was saying very cautiously, I think it's an important conversation. It's a difficult one. They're not obvious answers, but we certainly want to continue our discussion there on two fronts to try and see whether we can analyze better the effectiveness of the existing tools. So whether there's something that needs to be done, whether we have an understanding. So for example, in the EU, authorities have the ability to cap leverage that's in the regulation if they deem it successive. And another one, which is to look, another angle would be to analyze potential new tools. So do we need to complement our framework with additional tools if we think that from a macro potential perspective it's required ex ante? So we will continue uh, contributing to that debate. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Natasha. That was uh, very insightful, and uh, I think the role of supervision is 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 really is is not as. Um, as often discussed, uh, but it is extremely important for markets as well. In banks, we often talk about supervision, but in markets uh, and for market regulators, uh, the supervisory side is very important to, to make sure that uh, regulations are actually implemented in the right way, that practices are done well, that governance is correct.
etc. So, so that was uh, extremely, extremely helpful. Thank you. So let me uh, turn uh, back to Jeremy. And you know, Jeremy, uh, a lot has been discussed um, in the roundtable. Um, and you know, that is, you know, one question is, you know, what is your reaction to what you heard? The second question is, you know, more U.S. specific. Uh, you were not only a Federal Reserve governor, you were also at, at Treasury and the White House. So, you know, how do you see the policy agenda within the U.S.? So, um, my, okay. So let me let me start, if, if I might, just to come back to the, the question of central bank backstops. Um, so I certainly agree with Andrew, um, you know, as a normative matter, you ideally want the central bank to be able to be there in the deep tail. And we can talk about just sort of how deep in the tail, but, um, you know, I, I, I certainly agree with that. I just wanted to make two observations slash caveats. Um, one is, you know, I think we're more comfortable with the idea that the central bank backstops those that it also regulates. Um, and that, of course, if you can control the regulatory dials, you can, to some extent, control how deep in the tail your intervention will be, right? If it's a bank and you have more capital in the bank, presumably your, your need to, to backstop uh, is less. Um, that's less true um, in this situation. And I think, perversely, perhaps, um, the intervention that we've had may, in some, some ways, set back our ability to regulate. So, you know, one of the, you know, the Fed did a wonderful thing uh, by rolling out the primary and the secondary uh, uh, credit market facilities. I think, you know, they really stopped um, what could have been a, a quite, a, you know, really a serious, serious problem. But, it, you know, they, they ruined the empirical experiment, right? We never got to see how bad it was. And, um, you know, despite sort of the best efforts of, of the regulatory community, you know, I've been on panels like these with, with folks from industry who say, look, it really just wasn't all that bad. And so I worry that, you know, some of the impetus uh, is going to be blunted by, by that, that, that sort of observation. And, you know, one thing I've, I've heard that, that sort of frightens me a little bit is somebody's made reference to a survey. I haven't seen the survey myself where market participants, when asked, what is the likelihood that the Fed will be back in the business of essentially reopening these, these credit facilities? Shockingly high. So basically, you know, the market seems to perceive this not as a deep tail thing, but as a relatively, you know, something that'll happen um, next time there's a recession. And then I think this gets to my second observation. I don't think even if the central banks wanted to do that, at least let me speak for the Fed, because right? I don't, I think it's very hard. So in other words, let's think about the, these, the, these facilities, the primary and the secondary uh, credit market facilities. They were able to be um, put together with fiscal support. They were able, you know, they were backstopped legally. The Fed was able to do it because they had a backstop from the Treasury, which was in turn enabled by the, the CARES Act. OK, that doesn't happen easily. I think it happened in this case because it was sort of a really unusual case. It was an alien invasion. Right. I mean, here comes here comes COVID. It's nobody's fault. We have this remarkable cooperation from Congress, which we'll maybe never, ever see again. Um, so it's much harder to imagine that if the shock originated from within the financial sector, that we would have that con that, you know, Congress would give the Fed or the Fed would be able to have the authority to do to do this kind of thing. So even if you wanted to uh, be there in the tail. Um, it's 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 much less clear. So I think the combination of these two, with markets sort of expecting it, and I think the politics potentially making it um, very difficult, makes me sort of worry about you know this whole Fed, uh, the whole central bank backstop uh, idea, and just puts more urgency uh, I think behind the kind of reforms that we've been we've been discussing today. Um, I think the agenda in the U.S. I mean I think it's been basically laid out. I think the agenda in the U.S. is pretty much the same. Uh, broadly and needs to be done in cooperation with uh, with sort of the international uh, uh, reforms. You know, there are, as is well known, some, you know, structural weaknesses in the U.S. Uh, in terms of, you know, FSOC and things like that. The, the, the authority is particularly fragmented here. Um, the SEC is obviously the lead in the U.S. for dealing with money funds and open end bond funds. Um, it's common to hear people say, well, the SEC needs a new mandate. Uh, 
um, because their mandate is is around investor protection and market conduct. And you know, folks will say, well, they don't really have a mandate. Um, and you know, it's been mentioned a couple times here. You know, if it's just about protecting individual investors, you get a quite different view of things than systemic, right? I mean, in other words, one of the perverse things we saw after the the, the financial crisis was money money funds uh, regulation of money funds saying you should hold shorter maturity assets, right? That's good for protecting the money fund investors, but of course, if the money funds are investing in the banks and you're shortening the maturity of the money fund assets, you're just making the banks or the other financial intermediaries uh, more runnable. So, you know, th there's the idea that the SEC in some sense needs a different mandate. I don't disagree with that. I think that makes sense, but of course, you know, mandate here is not, is, is sort of a euphemism for something I think a little bit broader than just a legal construct. Um, it's, you know, the DNA of the institution. It's the people, the way they think about problems, the culture. Um, so I think the agenda is, is clearer, clearer. I think, you know, whether we will be able to have sort of the leadership and the ability to, and again, industry here is going to make its voice very, very well heard. Um, and so I don't, I don't know how to handicap, but I think it's a challenge. I mean, I think it's it's great, and I think, think we've made a lot of progress on identifying and you know being clear about what needs to be done. Um, we were pretty clear about what needed to be done with money funds last time around, and you know the outcome wasn't great. So so it is going to take a tremendous amount of will and leadership, and uh, you know all my best wishes to those of you involved in this process. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy. That was uh, again very, very insightful. Um, so let me let me try to f summarize the discussion. And uh, I've noted uh, five uh, trade-offs uh, that people were talking about. So uh, Ashley at the very beginning uh, noted that uh, there's a difference between shadow banking and market-based finance, uh, right? I mean, shadow banking really is just a subset uh, of non-bank uh, financial institutions, while market-based finance. Uh, is is a much broader concept, and NBFI is even, even even broader than that. And moving from shadow banking to market-based finance has certainly been a priority since uh, the global financial crisis. Um, a second uh, theme that was recurring was this question about ex ante regulation versus ex post central bank intervention. So what is the right balance? So of course the central bank has to come in at some point in markets. Uh, as, a, as a provider of liquidity, uh, last resort provider of liquidity that has balance sheet capacity when others don't have balance sheet capacity. But what is the right point and to what extent should regulations move that point further out into the tail? Uh, the third uh, uh, theme that I noted was the theme of microprudential regulation versus macroprudential regulation. And of course, the question of whether you need macroprudential if microprudential is very, very good. Uh, but my, my sense was that uh, there was generally an appreciation that we have to c keep exploring macroprudential, though it's perhaps not as, as straightforward to see how that is done in the investment fund sector relative to the banks. And then uh, my fourth uh, point uh, was about uh, the opening, really, about the global standards versus national specificities. Uh, capital markets are global. We want to have some uh, degree of consistent approach, but we do also want to allow a certain degree of heterogeneity uh, across countries. Uh, and finally, a recurring theme in this uh, discussion has been the amplification mechanisms and whether uh, tools like swing pricing can be used on the one hand, we want to see asset prices adjust and fall, uh, but we don't want that to be excessive. So uh, what is the right balance there in terms of um, uh, you know, containing amplification mechanisms and runtime uh, uh, mechanisms? So, so that's my, my brief summary uh, around these five dimensions. Uh, let me thank uh, all speakers. Andrew uh, Bailey, of course, had to drop off already. Uh, so the remaining speakers, uh, Natasha, Jeremy, and Ashley, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and, and good evening in, uh, in Cambridge, uh, Paris, and, and Hong Kong. It's wonderful to see you today. Uh, you certainly made my day. And thank you so much for participating in this fascinating discussion. Thank you, Tobias. Thank you bye very bye. much. Bye-bye. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Thank you.